you were a new cop in the 1940s, there wasn't a whole lot of training. The FBI had opened the first ever National Academy for Police, and it offered standardized classes in behavior, forensics, law, and communication. But even basic stuff like law and behavior, stuff we consider recruit level today, was reserved for high-ranking officers. Most cops in the 40s passed their basic aptitude test, and afterward, they just kind of learned on the job. Wouldn't it be strange then to be a Chicago beat cop and discover you've been invited to a banquet at the Ritz? A banquet where police of every rank and station, from recruits to captains, are eating filet mignon and watercress salad on $8,000 dinnerware. Street cops from the roughest neighborhoods and the poorest backgrounds eating the most expensive meal of their life. While guest speakers from Harvard Forensics lecture you about crime scene detection, criminology, and sleuthing. Oftentimes with more accuracy and depth than the FBI taught at their fancy high-ranking academy. Stranger still is that at the head of the table you might see a kindly looking grandmother in a shawl peering at everyone through Coke bottle glasses, quietly observing the lecture. Keep in mind this was the 40s. Reading about birth control was considered legally obscene for women. Talking about violence in front of women was absolutely forbidden by polite company. And discussing a grisly murder in front of someone's grandma could get you chased out of town. Yet here was Frances in her pinned back hair and polka dot dress, listening to the forensic pathologist describe the natural state of decay after a bludgeoning murder or the blood splatter patterns on drapes. If you were a new cop, you'd be confused by her presence or concerned for the sensibilities of this short, plump matron. But if you ever voiced your concern, one of the veterans would lean over and set you straight. That grandmother in glasses? That's Frances Glesner Lee, the first female police captain in United States history, also known as the grandmother of forensics. The woman who paid for the classes that educated Chicago cops on how to process a crime scene. And that diorama the Harvard forensic professor is using as a teaching tool? Francis built that by hand to educate Chicago cops on how to process a crime scene. Slide projectors wouldn't be invented for another 20 years. Murder documentaries wouldn't be around for another 70 years. But Francis knew her true purpose was criminology and she would use every single tool in life to get her there, even sewing her own murder scenes by hand when she needed to. You're listening to The Reengineered You. This is a podcast about self-empowerment and all the myths, lies, and misconceptions we tell ourselves. Then we use science and history to bust those myths and re-engineer a better you. I'm your host, Todd Laments, The Extrovert. And I'm the writer, researcher, and introvert, Joe Anthony. Purpose isn't something you're born with. Purpose isn't a lightning bolt that picks you out in the field. Purpose isn't a calling or a voice you just start hearing one day. True purpose really is accidental. Purpose comes from being exposed over and over to new experiences, then deciding after the fact which of those experiences is both lucrative and meaningful. If you don't find your life purpose early, You're not alone. Colonel Sanders delivered babies and practiced law before he finally opened a KFC in his 60s. James Lewis Kraft didn't start Kraft Cheese until he was in his 30s. And he probably wouldn't have taken that leap into starting his own company if Kraft's previous business partners hadn't dissolved the company while he was on a business trip. Left stranded in Chicago with just $65 in his pocket, James Kraft bought a horse and wagon and he started shipping his own cheese. Momofuku Andu was almost 50 when he invented ramen noodles. He saw people starve in the streets of Japan after World War II, despite the abundance of wheat flour being shipped from America as wartime relief. But the Japanese didn't eat bread, they ate noodles. So Ando turned American wheat into dehydrated noodles and found his calling. Today we're busting myths about finding our purpose in life. Myths like, myth one, Are we flawed if we don't have a purpose? What if I was too depressed to find our purpose? What if I'd never been chosen by our purpose? Is there any hope? Myth two, 
Okay. So we decide to hunt down our purpose. How do we go about it? It's not like there's a magical formula for finding your life's purpose. Is there? Myth three. Getting purpose late in life is well and good for Colonel Sanders and Francis Lee. But how late is too late? We're going to get into statistics and formula for finding our life's purpose. But first, I want to talk to Joe about the inspiration for today's episode. Out of curiosity, um, during your life in certain periods, have you ever gone through depression? Yeah, long (laughs) stretches of it, yes. Usually situational after a breakup, a job loss, a health a health scare. Okay. Um, we had an episode on depression. And so this this is not gonna be our depression episode. Uh we had a great one about uh Abe Lincoln and how vulnerable leaders are usually the best types of leaders because they kinda know what it takes to, you know, pick yourself up and move on. Um I had a close friend of mine who beat cancer or, you know, had had surgery for it. And afterward, like I'm so used to hearing people talk about beating an illness and coming back and feeling invigorated. Like they they take a beat, they, they take a bit of time to recover and they come back and they have a new lease on life. You know, they they realize that everything that comes after is gravy. Um, he kind of went through the opposite. Like, like he came back and he told me that he realized that he hadn't had purpose for a long time and that the cancer kind of highlighted that. And so this, we, we had this sort of episode already in our to-do list. Um, we had notes about purpose and notes about, you know, what makes somebody find purpose and what highlights their purpose. But we really have to start this episode, I think, with depression or or what robs your purpose so we're gonna we're not just gonna take this from zero to 60 this is gonna be it you know we're at a backwards crawl and then we'll start going forward when the depression turns into hopelessness yeah just can't crawl out of that hole how how does not just depression but like setbacks how does it affect your purpose it slows me down. It's roadblocks. <clears throat> a lot. I think about just off the top of my head. I think about businesses I've started, and usually it's financial. You don't have the resources, or the timing's off. You, there's you just can't get everything to line up, and it you have to start over. Right. So how different people handle that? You know, a life or death, like a cancer situation, is something like you have no choice. Right? Doesn't mean it's easy. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, there there are certain things that will take your purpose away from you or temporarily rob it. And it's not even like it's, I mean, it sounds very silly to say that having your choice, your, your purpose taken away isn't always a choice, but sometimes getting it back isn't a choice either. If you listen to our Abe Lincoln episode, that's what depression is supposed to do. It lets you stop, take two steps back, recalibrate, and move forward. And right, make different mistakes than you did before. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's kind of what we want to do today. Is how do we how do we rev the engine to start with, and then how do we identify what a true purpose is versus, I mean, like okay, for instance, you talk about your businesses and you've you've started businesses. Was money the purpose, or was building something the purpose? <laughs> It was something. It was a. It was a product that I was inv- that I was genuinely interested in. Something I enjoyed. Something I thought was useful in helping people. Helping people um, save money. Now, was it something that you know you couldn't stop doing? Like when we talk about purpose, we will we will eventually get to the the purpose equation, which is remarkable that that exists, but. No, I stopped those businesses very suddenly okay. <laughs> without much regret. <laughs> and I don't wake up every morning and say, God, I wish I was still doing it. There's parts of it I would miss, the money, and, you know. But overall, I don't think, oh, God, I wish I was back in bed with that now. Okay. Um, those, those might have been fool's gold. Those might have been false purposes, right? 
Oh, that's we're gonna talk about that. Like, um, this episode, uh, the whole second half is about fool's gold as far as purpose goes. Um, and and we can kind of see that with with Francis too. Like the way you know that hers wasn't fool's gold as she was doing it so early and so much, um, in 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 ways, in various ways. That's something. Um, studying purpose, going through these articles. Um, led me to believe that you will have dabbled in your purpose before you actually go do it for real. Um, so do you mind if we, we talk a little bit about that? Like, you know, the the glimmer of purpose in, in Francis and her life? Yeah, let, let me start the story with Francis Lesnar Lee. And let me start to when she was born. She was born in 1878 to Jacob and Francis. And they were from a very prominent family from Chicago, Illinois. And they lived in a very fashionable area. It was called a Prairie Street in Chicago. So this was upper, upper class. Okay. She had an extremely sheltered, privileged, overprotected uh, upbringing. She was American, like royalty. Now we've done some studies about social class. And how the parents can become just whack jobs on their kids. Right. They become callous. Their kids become calloused. Nobody has a sense of value anymore. No one's more important than their kids. They treat their kids almost like it's an expensive piece of jewelry. They, they keep it to keep it. Other people can't touch it. So she was raised with tutors and in a very strict, old-fashioned, women are submissive to men. You married your husband and support him in his career. So she wasn't instilled with, she had um, dreams and aspirations to become, to either go to become a doctor or a lawyer. But they didn't believe that ladies go to college, her, her parents. Okay. So without school and with tutors, she's not leaving the house. Like that is. No, who wouldn't want their kid to go to college, right? <laughs> I mean, it was a different time. Uh, can you, okay, so can you imagine having a daughter and they're like, I want to be a lawyer or a doctor and not just being like, thank God. Like, <laughs> right, that's right. everyone's it was, dream. It was a very different time. Now, there's very little about her as a little girl growing up, but that's what this wrote. She was only taught by tutors, private tutors. And what they made her work on, even though she was interested in law and medicine, they let her learn about interior design, sewing, knitting, crocheting, um, painting. So she was forced into this like home ec life. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's just unfair. She must have cried herself to sleep every night. She's like a one woman Joanne's craft store. <laughs> this, this almost reminds me of like Game of Thrones, where like they're letting the the girls so like they're like sitting around doing needlework while the guys are out like fighting with swords <laughs> well this is what's really cool so she built and we're going to tie this in later her first miniature um building like a uh, presentation kind of like a model right okay um and it was she recreated francis lee recreated the chicago sympathy orchestra in exact detail it had 90 musicians all their instruments, their sheet music, their stands, their cases, everything tiny, minute <laughs> detail, Joe. <laughs> and it took her only two months. So she was definitely a attention to detail young woman. They they only play sad songs. Just to <laughs> just she goes up with the diary room, she's like, Mama, I made a, an orchestra <laughs> and they just play music about me being lonely. <laughs> Do you think that having purpose in life, the, the times you've had it, has it made you more careful about like yourself, your health, your, your well-being, things like that? Absolutely. You do the little things, you, I would say goal list, but you, you take care of your, your rest, your food, your, your exercise. Your... Right. Like you got to, this is going to sound so cheesy, but you got something to live for. Yeah. Do your laundry a little bit. You don't wear the same clothes you wore yesterday. <laughs> right. <laughs> I can tell by how I'm doing, by how I smell. Um, you've heard the the old saying that, like, if you retire sooner, you die sooner? Yes. Is that a true thing? 
Well, I, I, I went looking for the benefits of purpose. Like, Francis made it so long. A spoiler for anyone who thinks that this podcast would end in Francis dying uh, young. Um, she made it so long, and I was like, that must be because she found her, her life's calling. Um, I don't know about the retirement part, but... Uh, according to a Time article we will link off to, um, you have like a... Th- uh, so they measure grip strength and walking speed for um, when you start aging. Uh, like those are physical signs of, of vitality. Have you ever heard that that like guys, is their, their grip strength as they age is like an indicator of how strong they are just all over? That was the old 80s, 90s bar thing where the big guy tries to break your hand when he shakes your hand. <laughs> I'm telling you, we used to do that for entertainment. Yeah, you shake uh, shake your, your grandfather's hand and his, his hand is like a, a, what do you call it, a lobster claw. Like <laughs> it just crushes everything. Right. Yeah. Or, or they have those machines that are like love testers in the bar and you like squeeze it and it <laughs> gives you some kind of gauge. It calls you names. Um there's a there's a little bit of truth to, I mean I I think if a old guy at the bar is breaking your hand that's just him being mean but um, there is truth to the fact that if you have strong grip strength it is kind of an indicator of overall body strength. Now that of course doesn't count if you sit around using a grip strengthener all day but it, it's it's pretty closely linked. Same thing with um, walking speed. So. Um, this Time article talks about how a Harvard uh, study started, and they went looking for adults over 50. And for a couple of years, they kind of monitored their grip strength and their walking speed. And they found that um, people who had self-reported higher purpose in life, they had 13% decreased risk of developing a weak grip. And 14% decreased risk of developing a slow walk. So that's not massive. I mean, that's that's not, um, you know, it, it doesn't mean go find purpose for your health. I just thought it was an interesting correlation that, like, there might be just a, a you know, maybe a 1 in 10 chance that your purpose um, helps you live longer. It encourages you to take better care of yourself. Um, now... Purpose won't stop you from getting depressed or or it won't save you from any anxieties or depressions that you already have. Um, you, you and I are both fans of school, um, school of life, right? Yes. Great public speaker. Yeah. I, I love his speeches about relationships. Um, have you ever heard about him talk about depression? No, I've never followed any of that. There. He has a talk where he, he talks about how depression is kind of a purpose killer. Um, and that's something we already knew. Even even before this episode started, we have talked about this. Um, but he talks about, in one of his videos, that depression might not be something to solve right away. If it is protecting you from looking deeper into a lack, it might be something you're not physically or mentally equipped to solve yet. At this time, you know, the tools and... Right, so instead of forcing myself to fix something I literally can't fix or do anything about, I will just get sort of depressed about it. Isn't this in the self-help podcast where I should just say, you just need to power through it, Joe. Look, (laughs) I've done it. (laughs) It's Uh, not that easy. Happiness is a choice, and you have to choose (laughs) to be happy every day. The the fork in the... Because it's not that easy when you don't see how you're going to get through this. And you sometimes I think too is either your dreams or goals or things you've been exposed to, maybe you're a little bit I don't know how to explain this. You feel a little embarrassed about it, like, am I being realistic? Yeah. And you talk yourself out of it that way. You talk yourself into being depressed by just feeling bad about the things you're hopeful about. Right. Uh, or you think that being depressed is foolish in the first place because it's like, well, you know, this is the human condition. Who isn't a little sad sometimes? And yeah, there's you, people, you there's kids with it. cancer, there's people with ALS, all kinds of worse problems than me. Why am I feeling sorry for myself? Yeah, exactly. Um, so I guess this is the real message of the podcast and one that 
I appreciate about depression, which is you may not want to solve it right away. I mean, like it, it, it you may not be, be equipped something to do it at this point. Type. Yeah. You, it's okay to not be equipped to solve it right away. It's okay to, um, to, to have your depression be actually sort of shielding you from a deeper lack in which case you should do what uh, I'm well there's a an advice list that Huffington Post has and I actually appreciate this I, I think it's good um, they say speak to someone about your feelings which is what Todd and I are doing right now um, I'm better it, at the Joe is though oh absolutely <laughs> I've been, of course I've been doing it a lot longer <laughs> I love talking about my feelings <laughs> my I noticed that subject. <laughs> So not so much. It's a little more guarded. Well, but when when I do, and and when when you do, clearly, when you talk about depression specifically, it it makes it real. Like it it makes you realize that you know it's not just you being a whiner or having something in your head that is making you a little bit sad. It is a real thing. It's it's you know it could be large and it could be looming. But speaking to somebody else about it, it, it puts it into context and it, it helps you sort of um, open up and it gives those emotions less power. Um, there's a new one on this list that I really like too. And it goes completely against everything I've learned in self-help. Um, on their list, they say, think only in terms of today. Ooh, that's a tough one. <laughs> you know, one day at a time. You know, yeah. Every day over ground, out of, over ground is a good day or whatever. But I don't know. Well, Try not to worry about the future or re- regret the past. Ex- yeah, that's kind of what I think too. In in a lot of self help, they say keep your eye on the goal. You know, look far ahead in the future. You know, imagine running across the finish line and having that ribbon, you know, rip apart while you're running through it. But I like the idea that depression works to shrink things and that by thinking, as they put it in this article, by thinking only in terms of today, things are easier and more bearable. And it's it's an easier and softer way of living doing this. Um, One of the ways I think of it is you only have one goal when you are depressed, which is don't have a perfect day every day. Just try to have more good days than bad. Um, and also by thinking in only in terms of today, you kind of give yourself a little bit of freedom and forgiveness, which I like that too. There's a, uh, a phrase I was introduced to, the grail will come again. And I had to look this one up because I had never heard of it. And uh, the idea is that, um, you know, when, when the Holy Grail in Arthurian legend went uh, missing and in the original legends uh, by Mallory, uh, he said the Grail is never to be seen on Earth again. And that, um, you know, part of that is because no knight is capable of obtaining it. Nobody can, can hold it. That kind of spawned the counter thought which is, you know, if you are suffering from depression or if you are looking for purpose and you think you've lost out, like it's too late, like you're, you're entering your 30s or 40s or 50s and you haven't found your purpose, the grail will come again. Like it, it is, it's just a matter of time. And if you stick around, we will tell you the statistics of exactly how much time, roughly, you have before finding purpose. And I swear to God, it is way more positive than I thought it was going to be. Well, that's encouraging because I feel that way a lot. And I talk a lot about, usually about my, some of my academic friends now, but a lot of my blue collar friends who seem to have their compass, their purpose very early in life. They just want to be an electrician. They just want to be a plumber. It's the most fascinating job. They love it. And now these people are outrageously successful. And I was, was jealous of them. And I thought, well, their dad was a plumber. And they just, just opened their own business, took it to the next level. They just they just were born with it. And the same thing with people who I have a friend who's an octologist, a, a doctor. And same thing. They just always knew they wanted to be a doctor. Their family was behind them. And, and it, their success shows. Do you, do you feel like it is somehow cheap if somebody has multiple purposes in life? Like they, they go purpose to purpose? 
Um, I respect it because they're searching. Yeah. But then I don't know where's the level of stick with one thing to actually have a chance. Yeah. <laughs> so, Thoughts? You mentioned people who like knew they always wanted to be a doctor and people will come out and be like, you know, I knew I wanted to be an artist since I was five or we, we, God, we hear musicians. Yeah. It's like Stevie Wonder, right? That's all I'm going to do. Yeah. We've done, we've done so many episodes about musicians who knew and were playing their instruments since like age two. Um, How much is that's the parents, the Tiger Woods, you know? Right. And I'm also starting to think that because, you know, a human is a basket of hobbies, tools, and experiences. So almost anything you do in life where you find your purpose, finally, you can just look back and paint a target. You can be like, oh, I you know, knew I wanted to do that from a very young age. Sure, you weren't taking it seriously and you weren't able to pursue it or have the money or time to do it until later. But you can totally pick up your purpose late after you've tried seven or eight other purposes. Have you ever had somebody in life who, like, you would have been embarrassed to tell them your purpose? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, having purposes and, and, you know, dabbling in public speaking and stuff. To me, sometimes when you talk about it or, or say that real um, spammy title of motivational speaker, it kind of makes it sound like you're trying to be a rock star, you know? Right. <laughs> you know, do you, do you get that too with, with writing? I, I definitely did. The, um, the, I'm, I'm making quotes. I'm writing a book. You know, I'm going to be a New York Times bestseller, and, right? I went to school for art. My, my parents, the big one was my, my grandmother. She was convinced I was going to come out of school doing graphic design and make a ton of money. And, um, I honestly didn't feel comfortable writing, uh, science fiction, wild, crazy science fiction until, until she had passed. And that is a strange thing to admit to another grown man <laughs> that I, you know, I needed to wait for a, a matron figure to not be looking over my shoulder before I could write freely. So she drove that into you that that wasn't a real job or you just knew that she wouldn't approve of that. Oh, she, she wouldn't have understood it, and she basically helped raise me. So there was baked-in disapproval that would have been there. Now, of course, success kind of throws that out the window. Like, you know, anybody makes X amount of money, it proves to disapproving parents that you've you've got it. And we all want that feeling, to prove them all wrong. Right. <laughs> and have them grovel at our feet and, and not give them tickets to our art show, right? <laughs> right. So when Frances, Frances had a, a death in her family and that kind of unlocked something for her, right? She did. She, she after college, got what I refer to as we know in the high social class and even this country, an arranged marriage of sorts. And she was married. She had three children. This is Frances. And then they had a long separation. They eventually divorced. She was only 37 years old when they divorced. Um, now, she became interested in forensics because she had a friend. She, she was she is already 44 years old. Okay? So she was not young. She was 37. She has three kids. Seven years after that, she became interested. She had her, her brother had a good friend. His name was George Burgess McGrath. And he was a student at Harvard, and he would eventually become the medical exam examiner in Boston. And he would tell her all these stories of these gross things that he saw at work. <laughs> and Francis just absolutely loved it. She just sit there looking over and over. So she would sit as like kind of he would come home and vent to her about it. You know, being her brother's friend and a big family, and. Um, she started to learn about the challenges they have of investigating crimes. It was a very different time, and I'm going to get into that in a little bit. But many, many, many murders, Joe, in these years were solved because it was just ignorance. There was just no training for the first people who were on the scene. As we know, you don't want to, what, contaminate a scene. They didn't know that, and they didn't know the importance of where everything was before everybody comes in and moves everything. Right. So she has this really good friend who's who's attached to Harvard, who's who's you know very accomplished in the beginning of forensics. And the forensics isn't even a thing yet. 
Her parents died in the 1930s, and she got her inheritance. So this is what she did. She endowed a large amount of money to Harvard so she could get her foot in the door. (laughs) That's how rich people do everything, right? That's how you sit in on class if you're not allowed to be there academically. If you're... If you're like, no, your your girl brains can't sit in here and learn our, our man science, then you just give them a bunch of money and you sit there anyway. Like you, you, you crash class. I just love this because if she was a woman and just said, I want to do this, they'd say, absolutely not. But when you offer them a few million bucks, they say, well, <laughs> right. let me get your name up on the wall. So she started this. It's the McGrath Library of Legal Medicine. And the first person she put in, the uh, to run it was her her friend, McGrath, who exposed her to all this stuff. So it's a win-win. That is awesome. <clears throat> I, th- there is something to be said about this. Like, we, we have Google. I mean, there's there's tons of podcasts and tons of, like, documentaries. I mean, I, I got my, my state's license because I could study online. She had nothing. Like, no no college courses. You mentioned that the cops were contaminating crime scenes and like walking through and just like stepping on fingerprints and, you know, kicking murder weapons under, you know, tables. So it is so wild to me that like her endowment and her specifically being interested in crime, if she had had any other interest, I mean, they they just would have gotten another wing of like law or medicine. You know, she had to be super focused but I think a lot of this says about her intellect and that she spent so much time alone. The fact that she would sit and listen to these stories and, and, and know that there's a better way of doing it, to think we need to solve this. Again, she had no law enforcement. She didn't really have that much life experience besides, besides being a daughter and, and a wife. Right. How did we, we said in the narrative that there were no um, slides that that the one tool cops could use to show each other crime scenes wasn't available. Um, so that's where, like, she started working her way in. She did, and what she started creating was these models of, of crime scenes, miniature models recreating to show people um, duplication, kind of like now we'd see what? We'd watch a YouTube video on something, so we get kind of familiar with it. Yeah, we'd see like 3D crime scenes rendered in computer and you'd see blood spatters and angles of shooters and weird stuff. But back back then, a murder you walk in or a suicide where the weapons were placed. But what was different about her is she got into real fine details on this. And so her models were almost lifelike for what they were. I mean, she got down to the details of pieces of paper on the floor drapes, wallpaper. I mean, these things were like art, Joe. Um, okay, so have you ever seen Rod Stewart's train models? No. Okay. <laughs> just, Are they just ridiculously... Yeah, fun fact, um, Rod Stewart isn't just a rocker. He, he, he's so famous at building train model and dioramas He's been on the cover of like several magazines for dioramas and like trains, like uh, you know the model tracks. Really? Yeah. I used to go to, um, I used to do miniatures for Dungeon Dragons, and um, I used to submit painted uh, caricatures like like you know elves and things like that onto the Reaper Miniatures forum. So I'm I'm in with dioramas. I'm I'm into this. I don't think you have the attention to detail that Francis is looking for. No. I bet she slapped that right out of your head. <laughs> yeah, she would have. She would have turned me into a crime scene for just yeah for for trying to show her my my clunky paintings. We kind of touched on this in the narrative, but the real one of the one of the many brilliant things that this woman came up with was this first thing of the seminar, where they get all these participants from the Northeast together and spend a week just working on crime scene detection. Now you think, yeah, we have those all the time. They weren't doing those. I don't understand why they have to have filet mignon lobster and have (laughs) $8,000 dinnerware. What is that that nowadays? $40,000 plates, Joe. Yeah, they're serving uh, food on basically a house. (laughs) And you just see these like 
grizzled Boston, New York cops jersey, <laughs> who don't even right. know how to use utensils at this time, right? These angry Irish flatfoots who have been like, <laughs> yeah, people have been trying to stab them in the alleyways, and they're sitting there, you know, eating filet mignon. But when she got these experts together, and she gets a process of this is what you happens when you come on a suicide suspected murder scene and talk to him about identifying who the people were, the time of death, um, stuff that's everyday police work now. This was all new. And they say one of the strongest things about this was the camaraderie of all the officers, all law enforcement get together, that they would partner up and get and share information from different cities. So when something happened in their city, they could reach out to that person and say, this is what I saw. What do you think? So you said something very interesting earlier, and um, I want to talk a little bit about it. You mentioned that while you were running your own business, you might have found fool's gold as far as your life's purpose goes. And I think Francis might have too. Uh, you know, she was making dioramas, but clearly not dioramas she wanted to make. She was doing, you know, the symphony or dioramas to impress her mother. It wasn't until she got, like, really into this that she realized that murder dioramas could teach cops how to walk in a spiral in a crime scene and identify, you know, clues. Um, so while I was poking around online, I, totally by accident, I found a really interesting term. And it is a Japanese philosophy that allows you to identify whether or not you are doing fool's gold as your purpose or if you have actually found a real purpose. This is a philosophy called uh, Ikigai. 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 Now, there's so many benefits to, to Ikigai. I, I'm, I'm new to it. I, I've only seen a couple of videos. I've, I've read uh, an article on positivepsychology.com. We are going to link to that article because I need to learn more and I encourage everyone else to check it out. But Ikigai, um, the phrase actually means uh, a reason to get up in the morning or waking up to joy. Like it, it puts emphasis on pursuing activities that produce enjoyment and gives you a sense of mastery, things that can alleviate depression disorder, which is interesting because we started out by talking about how depression robs you of purpose. And it says, like the philosophy of Ikigai basically says, if you get into a purpose that you love and it gives you sort of a, a state of mastery or um, flow, in uh, Robert Greene's book, he, he refers to flow state. Have you ever, have you done a, a hobby activity that puts you into flow state? Yeah. Meditation. Yep. Okay. Could you describe how flow state feels to you? Flow state feels like you, you already got the basics down. You know this like the back of your hand. Um, it's just almost like jogging if you were like a professional runner and you, you don't even thinking about it. You, you can go somewhere else and then you're, you're thinking more about the next level of performance. The next, the basics are already in you. Right. It's, it's sort of a, a connection of like your height of skill all connecting up at that high point to like, you know, uh, give you a better performance. And if you're competing, you, you're just a little bit ahead of everybody else. Yeah. And you can feel it. You, you know when to turn it on and turn it off. If you are a writer, flow state is when all of your all of your words are clicking and time disappears. Like that's the, the big hallmark of flow state no matter what you do. You can be a jazz musician. You can be um, lifting weights. You can be jogging. Um, you can be writing or painting. Flow state, the hallmark of flow is... Um, you are at a high peak of performance and suddenly time just like slips away from you and you're doing it for hours and you don't notice. Um, That's an interesting players. one with the time, Joe, because I think of that of what I was thinking about was when I'm selling at the highest level I've ever sold at or presenting, giving a speech. It's if you're really connected with the audience, if the, if if they're interested in what you're listening to, their time clock t turns off, too. Right. They don't think, oh, we've been here for an hour already. Or they're not thinking, when is this guy going to leave? They're not thinking that at all. 
They're just really, really present. Yeah, flow state, if it involves communication or storytelling or anything like that, dialogue, it does the same to the other person. Like you, you can totally hijack somebody's brain with flow state. Um, but as far as purpose goes, life's purpose, um, flow state is a huge part of it. All these things are. Um, okay, so I'm going to stop beating around the bush and I'm going to give you the equation for Ikigai. Um, on this Ikigai. page, Ikigai, uh, there is a Venn diagram and it's four bubbles. And where those four bubbles intersect, that is where Ikigai is, in, in the dead center. These are, you love it. So, like, the, the first the first requirement, obviously, is the thing that you find purpose in, you love it. F- Francis loved murder. <laughs> I mean, like, that old lady wasn't murdering people, but I mean, like, she loved the subject of murder. She was everyone's grandma who listens to murder podcasts obsessively. The second part of it is you are great at it. So when you find purpose, it's something you love and it's something you're also great at. You may not start out great at it, but if you love it, you will get great at it. You will just, you'll be able to do it indefinitely, all hours. You know, you, you will be driven to do this thing until you achieve a level of greatness uh, or eventually mastery. Now, here are the two parts that I did not quite get about life's purpose. I'm an American. I thought like guys that play guitar in a band and sleep on people's couches was romantic. I thought loving it and being great at it was enough. It is not. Ikigai has two other parts of this equation. You are paid for it. Ah, so this is a practical. This Ikigai is more practical than it sounds. Very practical. Um, you love it. You're great at it. You're paid for it. Now in Francis's case, she was paying other people for it. Um, but all of her, uh, all the professors she hired, all the cops that she brought in, they were professionals. They may have not been paying her, but clearly there was a monetary value in what she was offering. I'm sure uh, her parents would have been horrified of their inheritance being spent. <laughs> their oh daughter <laughs> spending their riches on this. <laughs> they sheltered her her whole life and tried to get her married to a good man. She divorces that good man and uses their money to open up a murder academy. So, now let's yeah. think about this. This murder okay. academy is in a nonprofit in North Carolina. She's giving this money to the already rich Ivy League school of Harvard. <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, her business daddy, he must have been rolling in his grave so fast. He was like a underground motor. Um, but that is, yeah, I always thought that too. If you find your true passion, you never work. But like you said, if you're sleeping on the couch, you have to get paid for it. Absolutely. It has to be sustainable or else you wouldn't be able to do it forever. Right, exactly. You will eventually have to give up your passion, your your purpose, if you're not getting sustained by it. And then so that brings us to our last part of the equation. The world needs it. If you do your life's purpose and no one ever needs it in life, then you've just been drawing chalk and it gets washed away at the end of the day. Then whatever you're doing, you know, it's it's eventually going to get forgotten. So do you think that there is if, if you're good at something, there's going to be a need if you're the best? Yeah. I have seen people who are who do art that is like counter to that on purpose. People will make, you know, um, uh, art out of salt or they will do art that will wash away in the first rain. They will do art that is specifically made to be destroyed or temporary, but the world still needs it and they still take pictures. So whatever your purpose is... Um, if you are really great at it, the world will probably need it, especially if you're the best. So with Francis, the world clearly needed it. Like they, <laughs> the world didn't know they needed uh, murder dioramas, but obviously there was a need. Um, do you feel like you can miss your ikigai? Like, like you can miss your purpose, but... If you match all four of those, that you're great at it, you love it, you're paid for it, the world needs it, do you think you can still miss it? I think, yeah, I think if you're not paying attention, 
I think it's through life. If you, you just don't notice everything, if you're too critical and you don't see any kind of promise of what this could be, what you're exposed to, and you still have to kind of have a vision of what my life would look like if I did this full time. That's true. I, I'm I'm kind of siding with the idea that um, <laughs> life isn't an amusement park. There's no maximum age for finding your purpose that you just have to keep poking and poking and poking at things until you find the thing that will hit all four of those for you. Well, Joe and I always talk about, you know, there's certain stories and any kind of self-help talk that you always hear. And Colonel Sanders ones always comes up. Yeah. And I always roll my eyes and I'm always like, <laughs> okay, yeah, he did it in his sixties, but how common is that really? And then I'm, then I keep thinking people are going to use that information like not to get started on their dream until <laughs> right they're f- until they're retired. <laughs> oh, Colonel Sanders didn't find it until sixty, so I'm not even going to try until I'm yeah. fifty. <laughs> and then my mom straightened me out on that. She said, "She said I don't think that's. I think he was trying everything he could, and then he's just finally the the dam broke. Then well, that's exactly right. Is in our opening narrative the thing that self help speakers miss oftentimes is that he was delivering babies and practicing law and doing everything he was trying everything until he found it which are both very successful things yeah and that's another thing too i think what gets missed a lot of it is we talk about how much money they make at the end because you can measure money but there's a lot of fun and a lot of learning and living too right right (laughs) and doing something that you love and something that you know is important that the world needs and it won't be the first thing you try. It, it won't be the second, third, fourth, or twentieth. Like you, yeah, you got to find it. Um, so once you find it, you you may not be running Harvard lectures about crime. Um, actually, can we can we sort of drop the bomb on this one? Like, so what did Francis? What did Francis need the dioramas for? You mentioned that it was because they were showing people crime scenes. Well, they have these great seminars, right? They're bringing all these people at the Ritz. They're eating lobster and filet mignon. The problem is there's no crimes going on. They can't jump on a bus and go see a murder, go see a suicide. <laughs> they can't right. time these things, right? So they need some way to have a movie, something that they can do as training materials and make the standard. And that's where Francis Lee, that's where this came in. And she started doing nutshell studies of unexplained death. And what these are, these little like movie sets built to scale by model that they can use as training. I like that you use the phrase movie sets because when I heard dioramas, I was thinking when I, when I first heard about this, I was imagining like a kid's science fair or like the dioramas you see in school, hers really are like tiny movie sets. They're incredible. The details are amazing. Um, she blended several stories together. So they were actually based, like all <laughs> movies, documentaries, they are based on real crimes. And then she'd embellish some facts and change a few things around. Um, and she used... Newspaper reports and interviews with morgue workers, police officers. I mean, these were really thousands and thousands of hours. Exhausting effort went into these. And for the record, the scale she used is one inch to one foot, which is the same as Dungeons and Dragons miniatures. Oh, God, he has to bring his geek stuff into this. (laughs) (laughs) This was actually cool until you just ruined it. (laughs) <laughs> now doing all this work you think this would be you know as big as dna solving um science her hope for this was not to solve crime it was just to be able to observe important details and potential advice so this is a training thing to get people paying attention and looking for evidence and not disturbing evidence one of her first ones she did was, um, this was in 1943. It was her first nutshell, and it was a, called The Case of the Hanging Farmer. And it and what it was was a, a suicide from a farmer. It took three months to assemble. And it, they actually, re, it was a retro or a, a recreation of a 100-year-old barn. Yeah. So that's how detailed it were. They even stripped the wood down to look exactly like it would. 
it's if anyone thinks we're like exaggerating to give this uh, give Francis Lee more credit, the detail is insane. Like the the little miniature ret the the character she used for the hanging man his face is purpled so that it's accurate to the rest of his body what happens when you when you hang somebody it is so crazy there's labels on soup cans she had a full-time his name was ralph mosher he was a full-time carpenter so that's all he did so they just geeked out on these things and now you know me i i can't talk about really anything that involves education or money without getting into classism. Um, a woman who has been homeschooled, educated by, you know, extremely wealthy parents, looking into murder, this might have, I don't know, kind of feels a little bit voyeuristic to me. Like she's looking at the rest of us poor schlubs through a window and what she's seeing is murder. Well, that's funny you say that. It is being such upper upper class. They made their nutshell um, model displays were middle class, lower class, um, seedy rooms, boarding houses, cheap hotels, places that she had never been to in her life. <laughs> right. Nor would she. And a lot of times, in this time, women there was a lot of domestic violence. That was hidden. It wasn't socially acceptable to go to the police about your husband. I don't know what the, it was then, but it was a very sexist time. So it had been hard for her seeing women who are kept controlled in living conditions that she wouldn't let her animals live in. Right. Do you think that affected her choices of like what types of murders to show, or or do you think she was just sort of? going statistically by what she was told by, you know, coroners. I think she was a phenomenal listener, and I don't think she used any of her... Um, the only thing she used her social grace was was, was to get more um, resources, to get more contacts. I think I think anyone else would have been able to do this or would want to. <laughs> right. her background, have the ability to and want to. Does that make sense? That is a really good way of putting it. I think that her having that, I mean, like you said it, she was trained to do all these intricate domestic things from a young age. She had the resources, she had the training, and she was just put herself in the right place at the right time. And time, and if she hadn't gotten divorced, her husband most likely would have forbidden her from doing that because it ruins his, why is your wife hanging out with police officers and, and looking at murders? That's crazy. You should have her committed. Right. If she wouldn't have got the inheritance and and been had that nurtured that relationship with her brother's friend and with Harvard, she, she just she was juggling a lot of things here to do this. They weren't begging her to do this. She created this. Right. Well, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Is we oftentimes say that people who find purpose they're in the right place at the right time. Honestly, I think it's more of she had her ikigai. She she loved it, was great at it, the world needed it. But I think she put herself in the right place at the right time. I think that might be really what purpose is, is you shove yourself into that place where you're going to be needed for it. Um, and if you don't do that early, I mean, like, <laughs> there are some things where... Uh, I think if you're really, really good at something, you'll be sucked into a place where it's needed. Like when we talked about, um, we've had episodes about musicians. That always comes up is like, somebody will be great at playing. Like our episode about Bruce Springsteen, he was like, you know, a teen being dragged into Vietnam. Rick Springfield. Yeah. Rick Springfield. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, Rick yeah, Springfield. Both before your time. So. <laughs> but... But you have these musicians who, like, they get great at something and somebody, you know, throws a rope around them and drags them on stage and they don't get to leave until they're, you know, burnt out at 60. But this is more of a case of, like, you find a purpose that isn't evident. You have to go put yourself under the waterfall. You have to go seek, you know, you have to be the pilot light in front of the gas. So I, I think that's... I mean, brave and crazy, but statistically, this kind of bears out. 
Now, I really want you to go to the show notes because I know we've described her as this grandmotherly thing. She looks like a very stern, old school school teacher, right? Who hit you with a ruler. She does not look like a fun. She's not a Charlie's Angels kind of detective that you'd see. <laughs> she really looks like somebody who would give you a hard time if you cut in line at the supermarket. Like she would roll up a newspaper and hit you on the nose. She'd be writing a check at the supermarket. <laughs> <laughs> so since we mentioned the statistics of finding purpose and meaning, I want to share with you the most groundbreaking thing that I found in my research for this podcast. Did you know that there was a study about when we find our purpose in life, like when our life takes on meaning? Really? And it it revealed the average age that people will find purpose at. Oh, no. (laughs) I know where you're going by your tone. I almost want to do a drum roll for this, but... yeah. Okay, let's hear it. A little bit already. Um, So one of our earliest episodes, episode 14 or something like that, or in the teens, we had a Time Magazine article uh, that we were quoting that talked about how, you know, uh, um, self-esteem peaks at around 60. And that was a mind blower for Todd. And that was a mind blower for me. And that was a mind blower for most of the people we shared that with. One in our show, and this is the thing. I always thought that your prime is your prime when you're at your healthy, your strongest, your testosterone, you're the most attractive. Your career's going somewhere, and I'm thinking mid twenties, yeah, twenty eight, thirty, maybe at the old, on the old. But it was so, and this gave me a lot of relief in my life to saying, you know what, I don't have to have this thing figured out. I still have some time. Yeah, I'm not supposed to peak until my. Yeah, your your self esteem peak is sixty. Well, guess what. Your purpose or your meaning in life peaks at about 60 as well. Is that a coincidence? I don't think it is. I'm so the way they measured this, just so you don't think we're making this up, um, we'll link to the article. Um, It was, uh, yeah, it's it's a journal of neuropsychiatry. Uh, It's called um, Meaning in Life and Physical, Mental, and Cognitive Functioning. The way they kind of did this is it was a cross-sectional data uh, taken from about a thousand adults and what they represented this with was they asked about you know purpose and meaning and the presence of meaning in somebody's life versus the searching for meaning and it was kind of buried in this questionnaire they shared with people it was a questionnaire of physical and mental well-being um, and the the short answer to this is when you're 60 or roughly when people are 60 the presence of meaning is at its peak and the presence of searching is at its lowest point. So it's more of a sliding scale where somebody is either searching or they feel like they have found meaning, but it's, it's at its best. These two um, are at a U shaped relationship when you're about 60. So I hate to say this, but the idea that you should listen to your elders Um, especially when they're talking about how to find purpose, there is something to it. So most of us have to look forward to having our highest self-esteem and our purpose at 60 years old. Something to look forward to. (laughs) It definitely is. It's better than uh, just getting the uh, senior citizens discount at restaurants. (laughs) It's a a (laughs) RP card. Right. If, If you were thinking... Uh, it's going to be awesome getting that 30% discount. Uh, Also, you get purpose and self-esteem. No biggie. So, speaking of no biggie, uh, Frances Glessner Lee, we haven't really heard of her in pop culture. At least I haven't. So why not? Yeah, why not? Shouldn't she be, though? As a trailblazer and, uh, you know, think of how many crimes she solved and got justice for people. How many... Chicago cop she educated back in the day when all they had was the FBI Academy only when they reached like you know officer um so what what did she leave us like do do I, I don't want to be the the a-hole but um does she deserve to be remembered yeah and, and her legacy is that's it you know she's a very successful woman she was the first female police captain in New Hampshire State Police so the, she was the first 
She was the very first woman invited to the International Association for Chiefs of Police. She was humble through it all. She identified and called herself a hobbyist. <laughs> you know, it would have been easier to say that she was a socialite who liked to play with, play with murders and dolls. Kind of like socialites like to invest in the ballet or the sympathy. Sympathy. Sympathy? Sympathy. Sympathy. <laughs> I can't even say it. That's a proof I'm in a lower class. It's, it's okay. That level of humility is crazy to me. If If you were... Say you were just made an honorary police captain. You wouldn't wear a badge around and be like, "That'll be Captain Todd." Like you, <laughs> exactly. And and then she'd go to all these things. She'd travel all on her own expenses and sit through these meeting after meeting and just wanting to train and make people better. You know, she she's created so many people. This is to me is even though Francis Glesner. Even though she made light of what what her contribution was to criminology, forensic, the world knows her as, and everybody she worked with, all the male people that she worked with, as one of the world's most astute criminologists. She was acquainted with and respected by all the top criminologists in the world. If you feel like your life lacks purpose, if you feel you've missed your lightning strike or everyone got an email about their true calling except you, don't worry, you're not alone. According to the philosophy of Ikigai, true purpose is the intersection of four vital components. Doing something you love, doing something the world needs, doing something you're great at, and doing something you can get paid for. Those should be your four criteria when you start searching for your calling. You love it, you're great at it, the world needs it, and the world will pay for it. Find that thing, and you've found true purpose. And here's the best part. Purpose isn't a soulmate. There isn't just one true purpose out there for you. There are hundreds of jobs, hobbies, and vocations waiting for you to try a sample. As soon as you find the one that fits into the Venn diagram of Ikigai, you're golden. Francis Klesner Lee was told she couldn't study law or criminology. She was held back, kept in the house, and force-fed domestic skills like sewing, knitting, and painting. But Frances Lee was patient. She had a purpose. She knew her grail would come again. When it did, she used those soft domestic skills to fulfill her purpose. Frances recreated murder and bloodshed out of flower drapes and needlepoint. And we can all sleep safer at night because of it. You've been listening to the Reengineered You. Thank you so much for listening to the show. You mean the world to us. We have a new episode every week. You can connect with us at www.re-engineeredyou.com. That's where we have research links and show notes and blog articles for each of our episodes. We also appreciate feedback and we love spirited debates. We're not experts in anything, but we've got an opinion on everything. Mm-hmm.